Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is um, Matthew Eltringham. I'm the editor of the BT College of Journalism website. Um, uh, and we're doing this in, in conjunction with, with the Frontline Club. Um, I think we've got a, a fascinating evening ahead of us. Um, uh, it's, for those of you who haven't been to one of these evenings before, this, these, this reflections idea is kind of, we describe perhaps infamously as a, as a mix between Desert Island Discs and This Is Your Life. Um, but uh, um, instead of choosing uh, My Way and Dancing Queen, we've asked uh, our guests to, uh, to choose um, some key uh, clips and key bits of content that uh, has, has influenced um, his, his career, his life, his, 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 his journey through, through journalism. Um, we'll have some questions, time, plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, if there's anything absolutely burning that you really want to ask in the middle of something, put your hand up and I may or may not choose to ignore you or ask you um, uh, to, to, to put your question. But uh, we will uh, uh, hopefully, if I time it right, get some questions in, in at the end. Um, so um, our guest this evening, I think, has had a refreshingly eclectic career. Um, started off um, uh, his working life uh, uh, training and, and uh, working as a music teacher, um, then became a musical director before moving into journalism uh, in the 1990s, unusually not via the NME, um, rather via Reed Business Publishing and Construction Weekly and uh, uh, Computer Weekly, I think. Mm. Uh, he joined uh, the BBC in 2001, just in time uh, for his uh, first broadcast appearance, famously on Newsnight on September the 11th, 2001. Uh, um, and uh, throughout, that, throughout his BBC career at Newsnight, he's become, he was one of the BBC's first bloggers and remains one of their most important and influential bloggers. And as such, has been nominated twice, I think, for the Orwell Prize. Yep. He's written um, two books. Um, his first, Living, Working, Live, Live, Working or Die Fighting, How the Working Class Went Global, was long listed for the Guardian First Book Award. Um, his, uh, his reporting on the global economic meltdown has found him on the front line, literally and metaphorically, I think, um, of the crisis, examining and explaining the social and economic impact of the unfolding events for, for his, his audience. Uh, equally at home on the streets of Athens, the boardrooms of the City of London, the salons of Davos, or even the shanty towns of Kenya. Um, he has won the Wincott Prize for Business Journalism, the Workworld Broadcaster of the Year Award, and the Diageo African Business Reporting Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Newsnight's economics editor, Paul Mason. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Paul, if I may, I'll, I'll uh, abuse my position and ask you a few questions to start with. Um, on your, on your Newsnight blog, um, you describe your, your editorial focus as people, planet, and profit, um, which is pretty wide-ranging when you normally expect an, ec an economics editor to be kind of forensically examining the ruins from Threadneedle Street. Um, w you know, wh why and how? Well, actually, people, planet, and profit is written into my job description. Uh, because I insisted on that when, when I took over from Stephanie, because I wanted to do, I was enjoying myself actually doing that as a kind of business stroke, industrial stroke, general correspondent, and I wanted to carry on, because this was just before the economic crisis hit, and I was worried <laughs> that um, it might be boring, um, but it turns out not to be so boring. Um, I, I, those of you involved in business will know that everybody in business except the complete antediluvian dinosaurs write people, planet and profit as the so-called triple bottom line of modern business into their, you know, their whole modus operandi. Yeah. And that's what I, I thought I wanted to, to... No, I haven't done much planet, actually, as it turned out, because the profit bit went quite significantly south in <laughs> uh, 20, 2008, and um, people have yeah, been more or yeah. less my main thing. So that's it, really. Fair enough. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is, uh, is elsewhere you describe yourself as, as, as a Labour historian. I mean, the, the books that you've written uh, are, are about the, you know, the history of, of Labour and you know, obviously the working class. Is that, do you see that as a separate part of your career? Does that remain in a box somewhere over to one corner, or does that inform your, your journalism and your, your life as, as a reporter? Well, it, well it's, it is both, because, I mean, the one book I've written, Live, Working or Die Fighting, which is a sort of narrative history of how the global labour movement came into being, kind of blossomed about 100 years ago and then fell apart um, under fascism and, and Stalinism. Uh, 
there was something I'd always wanted to write, and it was quite a personal thing to me to write it. So I'd say it is in a slightly different box to what yeah. I do as a as a working day-to-day -day journalist. But obviously it informs it because the the weird thing was you're going around you're going around say China uh, in 2003, and you're seeing you're just seeing something that that just looks exactly like what was happening in Britain in the in the 1820s, yeah, yeah, the formation yeah. of a workforce, and there. They've got, they've got nothing, they're kind of, you know, having read um, the contemporary accounts of the formation of the factory workforce in Britain in the 1800s to the 1820s, um, the exhilaration of work, the exhilaration of working, you know, 14, 15, 16 hour days, we know the horrible part of it, but what we forget is that that was, that was for the people involved, <coughs> It didn't just feel horrible. It, there was a kind of liberation involved. And when I'm interviewing a woman who's 24, come from a Chinese village, to a, in a plant that at the time, 2003, had 17,000 workers in it in Shenzhen, uh, I just thought it helps me just not see all the negatives. She's living in a dormitory, but I, it's absolutely clear she doesn't want to go back to the village. It's a one-way ticket um, into modernity. And I think my understanding of you know the history and having read the sources does help me there. I mean, the other thing has been, of course... Does it provide you with a kind of a, a context and analysis? It gives you one context, but you yeah. can't just bring that to the story. I mean, yeah. the, the thing, of course, is you, I've been interviewing... I'm working on a third book at the moment about, the, the, about what's happening this year, the, the global situation. And, you know, you'll meet... I met a, a, one of the bloggers in, e, in Egypt, a young woman. I said, do you know anything about what happened? Do you know anything at all about what happened in Egyptian history? You know, Gamal Abdel Nasser, do you know anything? No. Um, and yet she's one of the leading bloggers in the revolution. I, I interviewed somebody today who was involved in the British student struggle, and I, who, who originated the hashtag solidarity in the student movement. And I said, had you heard at the time of the trade union Solidarność? Never heard of them. Um, did you know the song Solidarity Forever? No. So there's two sides of it. You can also bring the aspect yeah. of that to, to, the, to the people involved in the story. I just want to ask you one more question before we do your, we have a look at your first clip, is, is that transition from music teacher to journalist, what, you know, what's, what's that all about then? I mean, well, um, well I, yeah, I mean, I was one of these kind of child musicians and, you know, I played the trombone in a brass band when I was 10 and I went to a, a grammar school that was very heavily focused on two things, uh, one of which, uh, you know, has since become notorious and the other one which, of which was brass bands. Uh, it was a Catholic school with a lot of priests in it um, <laughs> and um, and uh, the um, the brass band aspect of it was just totally dominated my life so I came went to university did music arrived at, at um, Sheffield University uh, to do music in 1978 and um, was just desperate to break out of it so I asked to do sociology but you couldn't as a second subject so they said we'll do politics okay so I did I ended up doing a music and politics degree which they said you can do it as long as you don't tell anybody you've done it because it's not really a degree um, so then I came out of there and, and I was you know I was obviously you know um, Music wasn't the only thing in my life, but it was where I was going to make money. Did two years of a PhD at Sheffield, didn't finish it. And, um, in of, music? Yeah, in, uh, in the second Viennese school, uh, Schoenberg, Webern and Berg. Um, musicology, basically. And so then I ran out of money and, uh, and uh, had to get a job as a school teacher. And then had a break because one of my mates was putting on a, a children's musical that needed some music writing for it. And so I wrote the music, music for a children's musical uh, called The Third Class Genie, which is about a genie who gets trapped in the modern world in a racist town. Uh, <laughs> and um, and that can't go back in the bottle and therefore he, he's just an illegal immigrant. Um, <laughs> But, uh, so this all chunted along, and I was trying to write serious classical music, and I came to London and was a special needs teacher by day, and by night, as I thought, was a kind of, you know, sort of in my garret as a sort of um, musician. Right. And, yeah. uh, and mus music and composer, but nobody liked what I was writing. And I kind of finally concluded, you know, you're not going to do it. Yeah. And so I kind of, you know, flipped around a bit and did... The moment I got my first real kind of foot under the table at Reed Elsevier, in Sutton, was that I just realised. I well, I spent two years. I, I really like yeah. this, yeah. and what is more, they were going. We really like you. Yeah. And suddenly, of all the things, I mean, years in teaching on and off. When you, it's, I never enjoyed teaching, uh, but they they went, you know, you're one of us, kind of thing. 
and yeah. why don't you just do this more? And I, yeah. I, I never Is really looked right? back. Yeah. It was just suddenly a, a thing. Uh, and I love, as you can tell, telling stories. And yeah. I suddenly realized you could do it for a living. And even at a low level, it paid more than teaching. So there you go. Fantastic. That's the story. That's the story. Um, so um, let's let's um, have a look at your first clip. I'm just guessing, looking at uh, looking at the uh, the audience, you most of you will be aware of Ray Gosling. Um, for those of you who don't, maybe um, Paul, you'd like to just introduce this first clip. Well, I haven't seen this clip yet, but um, Ray Gosling also was obviously in the news recently for the whole um, the, the fake um, fake death of somebody with HIV. Uh, which is, you know, raise, you know, uh, an old man now, and that was uh, a sad event. Yeah. But when we were kids in Lancashire, in Greater Manchester, Ray Gosling was um, on independent television, on Granada, I think, and um, he was the most brilliant um, reporter at doing what. When I finally came to be a journalist, I thought this is what you should be doing because Gosling had various formats that he worked on but they were always one, one single thing. He would go to a local community, he would find what their issues were, often he'd take a flatbed truck and he'd set up a podium and he'd get them on it and he would literally do you see, what was interesting, I remember this now, the, the only other people who were doing this were political activists. So if you remember the 60s, you remember Bernadette Devlin doing yeah. some of this in, 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 in Derry. You know, stand on the back of a truck and talk about rent. Well, Ray was doing it and getting paid for it by ITV. Yeah. And I, don't, I think we're going to see something like That's, that. Yeah, now. it's quite an extraordinary uh, clip, actually. The word for it in the Bible is being tough, possessed. And if the ancient Greeks caught you, unless you happen to be an epileptic whom they regarded as sacred, they would drill a hole into your head so that the familiar spirits could escape. Our Victorian forefathers were somewhat kinder. They built, well away from the towns, vast institutions for asylum. This is Whittingham, seven miles from Preston, Lancashire. In its time, the second largest mental hospital in Europe. Every mention of mental illness we always treat so seriously. No carry on up the funny farm. As if there cannot be laughter in a loony bin. Yet here with boyfriends and girlfriends, making pets of favourite Whittingham cats, the patients reside. Take Reuben. What brought you in here in the first place? I mean, what did you do before you came here? What did I do? Well, I'd spent years in divorces. And I was, uh, what? Depression, I should say. Depression. What brought it on? Oh, uh, too much money, I think. Uh, quite well, a uh, dramatic, quite dark piece. But listen to the writing. Yeah, and that's on exactly, mainstream yeah. telly. Yeah. That's 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 yeah. on at six o'clock, as I remember. Yeah. Uh, when children can watch, and also when you know it's the same you know the same slot that the, you know, the six o'clock news um, you know more or less adopts now, and the the quality of the writing and yeah. the it was always about people. That ordinary, ordinary folk. Yeah. Well, I'm not. Yeah. It's, you say ordinary folk, and, it, and it's one. That is one thing. But it's not just that, is it? He's 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 taking a an editorial standpoint, and he's deciding basically to do current affairs right in the prime time yeah. of family viewing. I mean, I thought. I just think it was the abiding memory. It's one of the big. You know, it is a big influence. I think. He also had a reputation for being kind of non-metropolitan, non-Oxbridge. I wonder whether that strikes a chord as well. Well, I mean, obviously, if you come from a place such as I come from, Lee in Lancashire, which is population 57,000, uh, mining and cotton, you kind of... See, the funny thing is, is you think the centre of the world is there. You, I, I, you, I didn't realise, you know, that, you know, Lee wasn't the centre of the world <laughs> until I was about 18. And so that, you know, it seemed natural that the, one of the greatest journal journalists of his generation naturally, Ooh. you know, reported from within 12 miles of where I was. And that, that, and that um, you know, as we're going to hear, and that George Orwell had been yeah. there to write his most famous book. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah. Yeah. Well, you talked about, you mentioned George, George, George Orwell. That's your second clip. Yeah, I think 
I'll well, tell you one, let me just say one thing. I mean, yeah. I, I know this, this format, this me and my spoons format, is, is one um, <laughs> that it, you can, you, there's only a limited amount of attractiveness to it, to me. But what I, what I will try and do tonight, what I'm hoping to try and do yeah. in this, rather than just rabbit on about me, is especially for the younger colleagues and journalists and students in the audience, try and talk about how I do things. Absolutely, yeah. Which, which yeah. I think the privilege I have is to work for a big, fast-moving platform um, where you can do in five days what, say, a doc maker, indie, indie doc maker, might, might have to take six months doing. Uh, so I want to talk a bit about technique. Yeah, no, we'll come, yeah, absolutely. So you want to talk, you want to talk, right, I'm going to, this is my second excerpt. It's Orwell, and it's, um, it's looking back on the Spanish War. Um, it's curious that more vividly than anything that came afterwards in the Spanish War, I remember the week of so-called training that we received before being sent to the front. The huge cavalry barracks in Barcelona with its drafty stables and cobbled yards, the icy cold of the pump where one washed, the filthy meals made tolerable by pannikins of wine, the trousered militia women chopping firewood, and the roll call in the early mornings where my prosaic English name made a sort of comic interlude among the resounding Spanish ones, Manuel Gonzalez, Pedro Aguilar, Ramon Feniosa, Roque Ballester, Jaime Domenech, Sebastian Viltron, Ramon Nuvo Bosch. I named those particular men because I remember the faces of all of them, except for two who are mere riffraff and have doubtless become good phalangists by this time. It is probable that all of them are dead. Two of them I know to be dead. The eldest would have been about 25, the youngest, 16. Now, why I choose that. I love Orwell. Uh, I love Orwell's writing. But that is reporting to me. Um, and I think the whole book, uh, 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 Homage to Catalonia, is... is. Uh, this, of course, is a, an excerpt from, from his essay in 1942, where he, where he reworks some of the material. But what I love about that is the description. It's the detail. And, and it's the recording of detail. I think what a reporter has to do is record detail, whether or not actually at the time it seems relevant. And if you look at one good thing to do is look at Orwell's diaries and look at what he records in the diaries and then what he turns into. Obviously, this is highly polished essay mm -hmm. prose. Mm -hmm. It's not a diary. But and sometimes Orwell, controversially these days, gets accused of he'll take two, two different uh, experiences from the diaries and make them into one event. Famous one is where he's in the road to Wigan Pier. He sees a woman uh, poking a stick up a drain. Now, he didn't see her at the same time that he says he saw her, but these days, BBC compliance would probably worry about that. Um, I just love the, the, the observation of detail that comes from the art. What, what, we could do a literary analysis of it. Why does he spot each detail and what meaning subtextually does it have? Believe it or not, even though you can't think about what meaning does the subtextual detail of the trousered militia women chopping wood actually, you can't do that in a one minute 30 package much, although the best of my colleagues really do it. Um, you can in a five minute package. You can actually start to think about yeah. text and subtext. Let's go straight on to the next clip, actually, in that case, Pete, and then uh, there's a couple of questions I want to ask you. Um, because the, I think this is kind of a, a theme through these first, these first three clips. Um, this is uh, the uh, award-winning journalist Martin Adler. We're here. We're not leaving for a while. Come pay us a visit. Mortar attack. The soldiers scramble into their vehicles and charge into Samara in search of the man who fired at them. Start it up, start it up! This man was found loitering near what was believed to be the mortar launch site. First Sergeant Michael can speak Arabic. He can cross the language divide that hampers so many of the missions in Iraq. But his Arabic isn't winning many hearts and minds. 
ما عندي كل شيء والله اعطيهم ايدك اذا ما تعطيني ايدك والله بطخ بجيبك هناك بطخك على براسك فاهمني؟ ما تطلع علي هذا ما هو بساعدك هلا بجيب كمان عشرة هون وبضربوك على راسك هذا بدي احطوك The suspect, bound and hooded, was left in a waste ground for hours before being taken away into detention. That's a very powerful piece of journalism. Um, I know you want to talk about the craft stuff, but I just want to talk about the approach that, that um, uh, Martin Adler, George Orwell, and, and Ray Gosling. There's a similarity there, isn't there? They're all kind of independent, perhaps anti establishment, maverick. Auteur figures. Yeah. Um, is that is is that something? Is that an approach you you you're looking to take yourself? Well, it would. You know, um, they all none of them worked for the BBC. Uh, but uh, for, all worked it for a couple of years. But yeah, but. Uh, yeah, less longer than I did. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, um, yes, uh, that's the kind of journalism I think one or a kind of journalism that that can that you should aspire to. See, Mart Martin, of course, died in 2006, yeah. was shot in Somalia. Yeah. And um, what I, I worked with him um, just about six months before he, he died, but after he'd shot that. And I worked with him in, a, in an interesting, with it, uh, to answer the question uh, by yeah. a roundabout way, it, we worked, I wanted to go to the Niger Delta and make a, a, a thing about Shell and its inability to stay on shore. Yeah. Uh, because it, Shell had already produced a report internally saying we can't stay on shore without breaching our own ethics. So they're in the process of trying to get offshore, I, into the sea rather than on the, in, on the ground. We applied to go and they refused us access. But Martin, being Martin, uh, went on his own and had got the commission from the same people we, who had given us the story, which is one of the NGOs. So he came back with like 14 ta tapes worth of rushes, and of course we bought them off him. And I, the, the great thing was to spend, it was something like seven days in the edit, because I voiced it, even though I wasn't there, because I knew what I wanted to do, and he'd shot it. And the thing was about it, I call, what you saw there, I call that the unflinching gaze, mm. because Unlike a lot of what you see on even a good program like Channel 4 News or Newsnight or Panorama, what you see in there is it's not unedited, but it's edited in such a way that it confronts you with lots of truth at once. The poor bloke being arrested, who knows whether he's guilty or not? The soldier, poor soldiers, you know, they're wrestling with a guy. They've all got guns, but they have to wrestle with him. How many breaches of the Geneva Convention went on there? Two at least. Okay, so he threatens to shoot a, a, an unarmed, unarmed prisoner, and then they hood him. That's two at least. But Adler has got complete access. They don't even know who he is. He's not even the BBC. He's not even some respectable guy from the BBC or ITV. He's just him. And that was the genius. So I think it's, it's, the auteur thing comes after that. Because I think what all of these guys had, above all Orwell, Martin uh, to a great extent, Gosling, it was all about Ray in the end. Yeah. Um, yeah but yeah. but nevertheless, so, he, yeah. You, yeah. he did get... Uh, incredible yeah. access to, to people and places, and so it's the it's people, it's access, it's it, even in that Ray Gosling, it's just leaving it, leaving the guy with the horse to sort of be silent for five seconds before he answers you, mm. is what you. Of course, in the news bulletin, you can't do it. Um, it. It's what the great documentarists really do, and I live in a world between the two. Yeah. And they're not afraid to, to challenge a kind of a group think, you know, and that's, that's a bit of an issue for us, as, uh, us at the BBC, isn't it? I mean, there is a kind of a BBC way of telling a story, a BBC way of kind of, you know, uh, reporting. There is, um, but it's highly diverse, I'd say. Um, what, one of the things that obviously we get criticised for is for having so many layers and, uh, you know, there's the Today programme, there's us, there's the news, there's Panorama, and that's just the, you know, that's yeah. just the sort of yeah. journalism, the PM, Radio Current Affair. You can, and, you, and people ask, well, why have you got so many things, so many sets of people duplicating? Obviously, sometimes it's, it's completely useless and pathetic. But one of the, one of the, one of the reasons, Stephanie's laughing, one of the reasons <laughs> is so that you can bring some of the, some of the wide palette of human reaction to it, because if we only had one, it'd be like state TV. Even if it was really good state TV, it would. And I think that's how we get around it. But I think, of course, that there are, one of my obsessions, it sounds very highfalutin, 
is about just, just constantly bringing yourself back to the concept of truth. What is true? We don't know, you know, philosophers have you know, worried about what, that for a long time. But I think if you start with it and constantly actually report what you see rather than what you expected to see, you always get the story, number one. And two, you always engage the audience because they're not expecting to see it either. Yeah. What they're expecting the guy to do is, he, is whether he's a baddie or a goodie, they're expecting the Americans maybe, you know, to threaten to shoot him. But you don't expect three squaddies to start wrestling with some guy in the middle of the, you know, desert. You just don't. Um, yeah. The ch yeah. Nine times out of ten, most journalists, you don't hit the standard you're aiming for. But the reason I chose those three people is that they are the standard I personally would aim for. Fantastic. Okay, so let's look at now at the, the next the next kind of section. Let's look at these um, this, this idea of these, these journey films that you know it's a, it's it's a it's a uh, format is probably not the right yeah, word to use, but, it, but it's you know it's it's a, it's a mechanism that you use to do a lot of your journalism for news night. Shall we see? Um, let's let's see the first one. Um, th this is um, something from 2007 um, about the use of about the spread of mobile phones and what that says about uh, the, uh, um, uh, the society and, and, and the economy in Africa. Nearly 7 million Kenyans own a mobile phone. That's one in three of the adult population. Across Africa, there are 100 million. And the continent is the fastest growing mobile market in the world. OK, so Kenya, like the rest of Africa, is going mobile phone crazy. So what? Well, some people think the technology could transform this continent, allowing it to skip an entire stage of the Industrial Revolution. Step on it, lay up on it, wind on it, lean on it, rock with it, yeah! I decided to make a journey through Kenya using the mobile network map as a guide to see the impact of new technology and to contrast it with life in the villages it's yet to reach. I want to try and find a place where it actually drops out, where we go off the network and people are leaving without mobiles. Hard luck, said my driver, Daniel Wambugu. Kenya's two mobile networks have already got about 80% of the population covered. But he did suggest, at the very end of our journey, dropping down into the Rift Valley. So if we get down here, coverage. in the middle of nowhere, what will I find when I get there? When you get here, there's no network. Other no people, network. though? Yes, yeah, there are people, Maasai people. Maasai people? Maasai people living there. So if so I get they there... Nomads. They are nomads. They're nomads? They are nomads, yeah. So they're not likely to be on either Celtel or Safaricom, I would imagine? No, no network. So... You, you do a lot of this. Why, why, why does it work for you? Well, you, um, one of the problems you've got if you make long-form video is structure. Um, and, and you've also got it in radio, but the, but the, the, the nail-biting moment comes a lot earlier <laughs> in VT than it does on radio. I've just made a 45-minute radio doc which goes out in two weeks' time. And uh, my producer said, you know, it's really hard to get after, past, 20, past 23 minutes. <laughs> uh, but in, in video, it, it's quite hard to, to get past, like, eight minutes, uh, unless you're really understanding structure. Now, I, I should say, uh, one of the real valuable things I've done is, is I went on the Robert McKee story course. And then a lot of people hate that Robert McKee thing because they think it's ruined Hollywood. But it actually... It's quite useful if you don't know anything at all about story structure, which I didn't until I went on that course. But it's not... Having a sort of through line just really helps you to bring in lots of disparate things. What I was doing there was effectively going through a series of case studies that I'd researched. So what I do is... I, I mean, let's remember what, what, what I do. We start off in, um, in Mombasa, and we go and see... Um, there's a, it's famous now, but this was when it wasn't famous. Uh, that's sort of the, the beauty of it. Uh, the, the famous sort of using the mobile phone to send payments from rural to, to urban areas. And then we go along and we, you know, we see a, a mobile phone sponsored disco where the upper middle class are. Now, interesting thing about that was 
two years later, the whole that upper middle class, liberal upper middle class who voted for Ryla Odinga really got their election snatched from them, and they were all involved suddenly in a civil war. But to see them at that moment before, I'm really glad I did that. And then the final bit of it was we go into the Rift Valley and we find these Maasai. And I go up to this woman and, she, and I go, you got a mobile phone? And she goes to the, her servant, Mob, <laughs> mobile. <laughs> and, and the servant brings this, she's got a big cheese in the Maasai people. Bring, she, servant brings this little, what they call the Chinese brand bell or bird, bird, bird mobile. And it's off. And she opens it up, switches it on and it's on. That, it, it just helps you tell bring a lot of things together. I, I, I probably use it too much um, as, a, as, a, as a device, but I've just done one, which you'll see tomorrow night on Newsnight, which is basically uh, driving from uh, Oklahoma to LA and looking at, um, at the way at the poverty in America along, along Interstate 40. But it allows you to bring lots of things together. Feel free to nick, the, nick it as a format. It's not mine. I think, you know, sort of Homer... Uh, more or less kind of perfection. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no such thing as an original idea, is yeah. there? Let's face it. But how much do you know what you're going to do when you, when you start off? Right, there's a difference. Uh, I am in revolt uh, against the way I used to work. Because making VT is so arduous and so difficult to, to string together, a lot of producers want to produce everything in advance and plan it all out. And Therefore, what they'll and camera crews are also because they know they have to deliver beautiful shots of sunsets and cars driving over the and f you know for every driving shot you see on one of these, there's ten been done. You just miss spontaneity, and so I've I've increasingly very consciously sort of revolted against planning stuff. And all I really know want to do is plan the, the route. Um, where, you know, a lot of my stuff, if, you, if you're interested in it, it's all on the BBC's website, you'll see bits where I really achieve what I want to do, which is where something surprising happens. And you just go into it and you start riffing with whoever it is you've met. You know, we went into a Muslim village in western China and, um, and we, were trying, <laughs> we were trying to set up a big discussion about the issue involved, which the programme was about, which was about the fiscal stimulus, but they'd never really seen a Westerner. There was a real rural Muslim village, and all the guys had homemade big giant glasses, and and they kept going on, and my 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 translator kept falling off her chair laughing because they <laughs> they kept just making jokes about me and and about how many wives did I have, and and, and it was and and I ended up making jokes back with them, and it was just really funny, and we and that's what I want to do now. I mean, I, I but. Those of you who are involved in, I, I think doc makers are good at it because they're already making a, an OBS doc about everything. But we have been trapped, I think, for too long in this sort of, you know, sort of we're, we're putting together a series of scenes almost like in a feature film. So do you know what your film is t for tomorrow night is going to say yet? I do. I'm glad to say it's on the track. Um, but uh, this is the power of Abid, of course, now, that I will tweak it tomorrow depending on whether the US debt situation is sorted or not sorted. And I will tweak the, the script of it fairly radically, either towards an economics focus about basically, look, all these people, the poor, the homeless, the migrants, uh, the, the Oklahoma farmers who are in the middle of the worst drought for 60 years, they've all got reason to depend on the American state and the federal government, and they're, they're all going to be screwed if, if, if the federal government pulls the money away from them. That's one way of doing it. Another thing, it's a human story. And I might just, in, even now, me and my producer, Dan Kelly, are working on it. We might even just go, right, there's the debt crisis. Um, that's, we know what was going on with Obama and Boehner and everybody. But meanwhile, the real world's going on. Um, and, I, and I'm pleased to say, like, no, I'm working with, you know, I, I work regularly with, with, with when I'm in America doing this stuff. You're going to, you're going to see one of my American yeah. pieces. I work r regularly with a, a couple of camera crews who totally get what I'm trying to do. And effectively, what we keep saying to them is, just make a documentary about me, um, even though that's not what it comes out as. It is, this, imagine you're making a documentary about me going to America. What you, then you get the shots. Let's have a look at that one, then. This, yeah. this, is, um, this is Starbucks. We use Starbucks as the, as the canvas to... Every era has its own symbol of the American dream. And for me, this is it. Starbucks.
It's not just about coffee, it's about networking, a new lifestyle, ethical sourcing, flexible work, the information age. In the good times, Starbucks expanded relentlessly, away from the big cities, away from the student towns, and into small town America. But now, the good times are over. 600 branches are closing, and the dream is on hold. If you look at a map of the Starbucks branches that are set to close, it's a map of the economic crisis ripping through America. I decided to go from point to point in the industrial Midwest, in states that could still swing either way, to find out what's causing this and whether anybody can bring the good times back. I didn't tell Starbucks I was going to do it, so um, <laughs> and they never really particularly liked this. Um, in the end, um, what was good about that? We went, we, what was great was just driving to towns you would never go to, and there was no reason to go to any of these places. Most of the Starbucks yeah. that are closed were drive-through Starbucks, but a few of them were kind of sit-down type ones. And I just w went in and just talked to people. Now, because of the BBC rules that you wouldn't have if you're making an indie dog, you know, I couldn't then use, I couldn't wire myself up. And because I had no access, you know, we, we couldn't film in the Starbucks. But it didn't stop us. We just went from place to place looking at the people around the whole situation um, and it just became a device. The best bit was when we got to Detroit where we did film inside of Starbucks but that we, we actually never showed it because they because the, it was closing and the staff you know were, were frightened that we would get sacked. But a guy came up to us while we were filming and he said Look, it's in the worst place in Detroit. It's a real, real ghetto area with drug, drug people on the streets. And he said, look, this is the only part of modernity these guys have. They come in here. They've never seen anybody with a laptop. They've never seen one of these leather sofas. The music is un alien to them. And they sit here. And he was like a community activist. And, I say, and he says, you know, and, 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 and guess which one Starbucks are closing. You know, the, Starbucks had 21 branches in Detroit. This is in 08. September 08. There's 47 on the Berkeley campus alone in uh, California, but it closed nine of them uh, in, 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 in Detroit. And that, I, it was just a metaphor, because I went to yeah. Ford, Dearborn, I went to uh, some of the small areas, talked to farmers. So it was a, the Starbucks thing was like a, a frame yeah. Yeah. That, that you drop things into. And as I say, the, the total reason for doing it is because it's the only way you can tell a narrative out of a disparate series of toys, there are other ways. But it, it's epic rather than novelistic, for those who know what that's about. <laughs> <laughs> so, OK, well, let's, let's, let's crack on, because there's, um, uh, there's, there's plenty more to get through. Um, kind of the opposite end of that, if you like, is, 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 is the lives, is, is the, is the yeah. two ways. Um, let's, let's have a look at um, the, the, next, the next clip, and, and we'll talk about it off the back of it. Well, Jeremy, this attack has really taken the heart out of the world financial system. Um, it's located in New York. That's its financial center. And these two buildings are actually home to some of the key companies in the stockbroking and allied trades um, of the world economy. Um, Morgan, uh, Morgan Stanley alone um, occupies 50 floors of the South Building that was taken down today. And there's a whole ecosystem of other companies allied to that. Well, there are 6,000 people in the building behind me, part of half a million refugees sitting on rugs and mattresses all over the south of the United States. And many of them, as here, did watch President Bush's arrival uh, into this region. I think it's very fair to say there is a great deal of dissatisfaction, uh, not to say disgust, with uh, the lack of coordination. You don't hear people spontaneously just blame the president, though. Everybody here is aware that there is a, a dynamic between the state and the federal government. But, and there's also, it's tempered by the unwillingness to be seen to be playing politics with it all. Uh, today, the stock market here has fallen by about 4.5%. And instead of ordinary investors being wiped out, as they were in the 30s, it's the banks being wiped out. Now, in theory, the loss of Lehman, the takeover of Merrill, on top of Bear Stearns, on top of Fannie and Freddie, the bailouts there, should, in theory, be able to lay the basis for recapitalizing the banking system and, in maybe one or two years, the easing of the credit crunch. But that's the theory, because we still don't know how many big, nasty, 
possibilities there are out there. Well, our economics editor, Paul Mason, is with me in the studio now. Um, what's the impact of all this? Well, today was supposed to be a global coordinated attack on the problem to stem the panic. Congress was supposed to vote yes. There was a $620 billion injection overnight of funding from central banks into the system. Wachovia, as you saw, got taken over. BNB gets, Bank from Bingley gets nationalized. Uh, there is a nationalization of an Icelandic bank. Fortis in Belgium is, is nationalized. It all comes together, but the main regiment didn't turn up. Instead, the American people kind of turned up in, in Congress and, and, and had a voice. And you see the effect on the markets. Uh, the 6.7% the off the Dow, 8.9% off the S&P. If there's another day like that tomorrow, that is 1929 Wall Street crash territory. So the lives are two ways. It's a standard television technique. What are you trying to do with yours? And is that... I'm trying to get through them. <laughs> <laughs> I hate them. <laughs> um, I, I'm not a great sort of natural um, communicator uh, in that respect. Um, uh, and I always find them a bit of a trial. I thought, I, I'll tell you, the, the, the interesting thing was, obviously 9-11, was that was my first ever live on Newsnight. How long have you been on Newsnight before that? I'd done one VT. Right. And I'd been on there for two weeks. Right. So um, it was... And my mates... Because... Uh, one of my friends fell asleep and didn't realise I'd got a job on Newsnight and there was 9-11, they were hyped up and they woke up and I'm, I'm on the telly. They thought, they, they thought it was, they died and it was, they were dreaming. And, and, but my other mates were rather more prosaic. They said, Paul, two weeks ago you were reporting on the SQL Server 8, which for those who don't know it, is a Microsoft product. And today you're reporting on the biggest story in, in human history. Um, so... Um, so it was a bit of a challenge, actually. Yeah. I, I think, you know, the, you could see me. I'm glancing down because I had it written on a, on a little paper about Morgan Stanley. I got it wrong, though. It's actually 25 floors that Morgan uh, Stanley Dean Witter actually had. But what I was d doing there was trying to... Everybody was scrambling for detail. And, and one, had, uh, one had used very, various journalistic techniques to get detail and, in fact, reaction from New York, even as it was going on. Obviously, as you're ringing people up, you didn't realise, you know, the building's going to collapse yeah. in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. But by that time, I mean, it was the, the only reason I'm standing there in the newsroom is because they couldn't fit me on the set, because we had Barack, Ehud Barak. We had, can you remember, David? We had, we had everybody on. So uh, it was terrifying. But, look, I, I think, you know... They haven't got particularly much better, but um, what, I, what I do do in them is I just try and loosen up and chill out and not worry now about communicating facts, because it, it, the problem about communicating complex facts, like graphs and all the rest of it, is A, it always goes wrong, and B, it stiltifies things. And it took me a long time, and it took Newsnight, I think, a long time to learn to, to, to just not bother with that and just do it as if you're in the pub trying to explain to somebody. I know that's what they say. Vin Ray, who often does this, yeah. that's his first lesson. Explain it all as if you're in the pub. Yeah. But the problem with yeah. economics is you also have an information-giving function. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, those lives, I'm not holding them up as... I, I actually do think that the one on the tarp, because it had just happened, and to try and draw an immediate summary about what that meant was a good one. The Lehman wasn't so good, because actually... I was wrong. You know, it, we, AIG was about to collapse. And in fact, Lehman was much no, more serious than we realised it was. Uh, even then, you're, obviously everybody's there, you're live outside. I, I don't think I, in my mind at that point, realised we're going to have AIG. Uh, Merrill's been taken over. Wow, how great. You know, I didn't really realise what a slide was about happening. I'll tell you a story, though. While we're making that, and then the next day the AIG piece, which, again, is on, on the internet, it's worth a look, uh, for how to do it and how not to do it. I'm trying to edit, and my cameraman is editing on, the, on his laptop in the BBC office. And, and, and I was really annoyed by him, because he was like doing something on the internet. And I said, well, why, you know, we've only got two hours. Why do you keep doing this thing? He said, I'm taking all my money out of the bank. <laughs> and, uh, and it's always worth, because two days later, what we learned was that everybody else was as well. Um, there'd been a, what we call a silent, a silent run. And if I'd only listened, if I'd only actually asked him why, and realised that 400 sort of billion was being taken out at the same time, I would have probably got the story. Yeah, you've got to listen to your cameraman, haven't you? You do. Yeah. <laughs> and women. Yeah, of course. Um, okay. Um, 
let's uh, let's continue that the kind of the conversation about about craft in a way. A um, uh, couple of um, kind of kind of live live bits really. Yeah. You know, kind of reporting, you know, if you like, from the front line. Let's have a look at the Greek one first, um, and we'll, we'll talk about about the craft in that and what you're trying to do. We will not stop. You we won't not, stop. No, of course we will not stop. They they, they must stop. The government must. How will you make them stop? With strikes and uh, with demonstrations, oh, everything. With squares. We will come here. We will not stop. What's happening? But the violence wasn't stopping either. And for many here, the legitimacy of the whole political system is now at stake. Are you a British station? Okay. There is a group of uh, riot police coming down. They're spraying us with chemicals. We are peaceful, if anything. We just want this government. This fascist government to get out of the way. As the fighting spread into the side streets, just yards away, people gathered in the cafes to watch the austerity vote go through. The vote passed 155 for, 138 against. But outside, there are millions against, not just the left, but the middle classes who are supposed to be the backbone of Greek democracy. And so, 10 to 4, typical Greek cafe, people watching the vote, and on split screen, the riot. And just behind us, the riots happening. And this is the image of the European Union today. Official reports say 47 people have been hospitalised, 29 arrested, 192 treated for breathing problems. But the biggest casualty is consent. In no European country is the gap between politicians and the people so obvious, widespread and bitter. So what are you trying to do with those two pieces of camera? Um, well, they were the best of, <laughs> they were, we did a lot. Um, well, one, you're down there. I mean, to get, get down there on the streets, um, what can I say about this? You had to slightly give the BBC system the slip, OK? Uh, because, um, you know, we didn't have a security man with us. Uh, me and the camera crew who I was with, Julie, Julie Ritson, are quite experienced at that. We've been on the courses, but I've been together and separately into situations like that. So we knew, and I'd been there before, and they were attacking camera crews all the time, or the protesters always attacked the camera crews. Don't. Just in Greece? Or yeah, in it? Greece, in Greece. And, no, but because I'd been doing it for about three, I'd done two days, two weeks before, and then I'd done a day before, so that's the fourth day of rioting in two weeks. I felt quite confident that if we went into it, we'd get detail. And I think the key detail, leave aside the piece to cameras, the key detail, there's a shot in it, I don't know if you remember it, where you see from the back a lot of blokes chucking things, there's a little yeah. burning barricade on the floor. That's one that we shot. Some of the top shots were shot by our colleagues in the BBC who were on the top of the hotel. But the, 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 the interesting thing about that shot, and I've got all the other rushes, and I'm writing about this as well, they were not anarchists. They were just blokes from down the street. They were, it was like if it happened here, and a bunch of anarchists had had a riot here, and all the good old boys in the chip shop and the kebab shop were going, bloody hell, look at what this is going on. Right, bang. Uh, to get, you can only understand that if you're there, and you've acclimatised yourself, and you're actually there. I mean, if I was to lose one of the pieces to camera, I'd lose the one in the cafe. Cafe... I mean, we were exhausted by then, um, and I, I could have done a better one there. The one, uh, the one, uh, the earlier one, uh, and the bit where I'm trying to interview everybody. It, well, you know, this is what I say to: um, if you're working with really brilliant camera crew and, and a good, young but quite feisty and experienced producer, Nicholas Blakemore, our producer on that day, you really, um, you really, you can take the not the unconscionable risk, but you can take the chance that they're not going to lamp you on, and that they kind of understand it. They were looking at us, what's a camera crew doing here? Because we usually lamp them. And they were going, and then all these people start speaking English. And that bloke, Costas Custos, <laughs> you know, I mean, he came up to me and he said, I'm an interior designer. I mean, <laughs> it was, but I kind of got it. You know, I kind of got it. He said, I'm an interior designer. The other guy, the, there's a guy in a mask who's kind of pushing his way. I, I voxed him as well. He said, I studied at the effing Royal Academy. I'm a concert pianist. Uh, and you suddenly realise what you're talking to. I mean, I mean, 
it is, it, this is big in my mind because it's only four weeks ago, so it's kind of there. But you, there's no rocket science. All my colleagues, are, all my colleagues I work with, you know, are totally capable and have done it. But the brilliant thing about Newsnight is I don't have to reduce it to one minute thirty. Mm. So there's no way any of that stuff with the gut push and shoving, what you're doing, who are you, whatever, could get into a one minute thirty piece. But in a five to six minute piece, there, I'll gladly lose the PTCs, the piece to cameras, to get more of that. Isn't there a danger though that you might you're caught up in the moment, you're caught yeah. up in the story, and 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 where and do you sometimes worry that you might lose context and perspective? No, I don't really, because I mean context and perspective is obvious, isn't it? I mean the the thing that if you were to say, well, of course, um, what would you say? You know, the, the the worst possible type of be old style BBC with, of course, there is another view. Let's go to a place <laughs> where everybody's sitting on their backside in a coffee shop doing nothing. Um, well, a that's not the story. B, you know, we're in a situation, no, don't, don't think that's all I was doing. No, I mean, yeah. actually, in, my producer persuaded me not to put it in the piece, and I put it into a two-way, live off the back. I interviewed an academic, and me and the Greek fixer, because my producer was so worried about getting the piece out, he and the camera woman stroke editor stayed in the hotel room to edit, and me and the Greek fixer walked a mile to this bloke's office, and I shot the interview with him. But I was determined to get what you might, what news wouldn't, news can't do. You either do a riot or you do some economics and politics. I thought, well, get this bloke. And he gave me some great lines. I, gave, I used one. And it, it was literally, it was, what was it, something, it was something like, you know, they, it, it was all about the potential of this to spiral it in an undemocratic way. Because what all the people on the streets, of course I spent hours on the streets not rioting with people who were not rioting. Uh, and I wasn't writing, uh, uh, talking to people and they were saying there's no positive outcome to this. You know, the communists, the leftists, Syn Synaspismos has got uh, 13 MPs, they're the Trotskyists. They're saying, we don't think we're happy. We are terrified that this is going to end up in a right wing or a kind of weird, crazy, an anomic, they call it, anomic outcome where society collapses, like Hurricane Katrina. Um, so once you're aware of that and then bam, you know, it starts going off, you can, you can, I'm bringing that. Of course, what you're then relying on is your colleagues on the programme to go, what's missing? Have we got a Greek politician? I mean, we're relentlessly trying to pull Greek politicians. Problem is, they can't leave their homes at this point. They can't, they're just trapped. And uh, yeah, I'd say the balanced side of our total coverage on Greece, I would have wanted many more politicians. Problem is, they're just sitting behind shuttered windows, yeah. terrified. Yeah. Yeah. Let's quickly look at um, the, the, the second one on this because I want to move on quickly to, I want to move on and have enough time to talk about yeah. blogs and social media. Um, this is um, from uh, 2010, December 2010, student protests. Yeah. <laughs> With the debris still evident tonight, yards from Parliament, what went wrong? 2 p.m. was the moment police began to lose control. A small group of protesters tried to break away from the agreed route. And the police drew batons to contain them. The national leadership of NUS refused to support the march and were not on hand to lead it. The march organisers negotiated this route with the police, taking the march past the corner of Parliament to a final rally by the River Thames. The organisers did go there, but the majority on the demo did not. They broke into the square, which was sealed at two exits. Watch yourself. The fences would soon become weapons, and by now, the only line of defence for Parliament was the last line, the territorial support group, the Met's elite full-time riot squad. Suddenly, the rear of the crowd tried to escape the square westwards past Westminster Abbey. You can see, as we moved through it, the crowd was not aggressive, but towards the front, finding itself blocked, those determined to fight soon appeared. It was here that the crowd violence and the police response escalated. Snooker balls, fireworks and flashbangs were thrown. Mounted police were drawn back and then put in a series of charges. 
I mean, all I'm trying to do there, that was after, that was done the day after the student demo stroke riot. And what I'm trying to do, I, we went back to our rushes and tried to piece it together. Because um, I just think when you get a serious sort of um, big event like that, uh, which caused huge, I mean, the Met, you know, we're under pressure. Stevenson was under pressure to resign over that, of course. That was the background to that piece. And I was there because I just happened to be there and I was covering the student process. I think kind of, I don't know how I ended up covering the student process, to be honest, because there's mm. so many other things that could have been reported on. Mm. But I, I think it's really because I ended up being able to get access by just using my contacts to get access to various, I mean, SOAS are still after me for going in to film when they were in occupation because meant to ask permission, but we didn't. Um, uh, but that's your, the rat-like cunning. So, um, <laughs> so having got access, I kind, of, I kind of stayed on the story for a bit. I thought, it, well, of course, it's in my realm because it's about fiscal policy. It's about cutting, the, cutting back the uh, student thing. But I thought, well, actually, since there's such a big row about this, and I was there, and I had two crews, uh, both producers shooting, actually. Now, the cameraman and the producer shooting. So some of that was shot by the producer. Let's go back and work out what happened. And I think you'll find just that one minute mm. is probably the most comprehensive account, certainly to be done within 24 hours, of what actually happened. Because at this point, there's a kid in um, a coma, because it could have turned into a Blair Peach situation. And he was, actually, I've no found out, that breakout bit where I'm walking through the crowd with the crew it is more or less where uh, Alfie Meadows did get hit. And it, it turned into something worse for him and for the Met. That would have been... Yeah prima facie yeah, evidence yeah. of what was going on. I, I'm disappointed, the one bit that I'm disappointed in is that because of time issues and archiving issues of the BBC, we didn't use the worst of the violence. The protesters were more violent than that, than is shown there. And we relentlessly tried to find our rushes, but I can't, for some reason, we didn't get it on there. Okay, um, the last bit of, of um, before we open it up, uh, up, up to, uh, to, to the floor, um, blogging, social media. Mm. As you know, a big part of what you do. Um, just you know, how did you get into it? Why is it? You know, it's changing the way that we do our journalism. Yeah. Look, well, I first of all about me. I, I am. A, you know, I I bought a Sinclair Spectrum when I was 26 <laughs> with my first wage packet. <laughs> I've been into computing uh, as a kind of geek ever since. But when the internet came along, I was on CompuServe, and when when the internet came along. Um, it was kind of like Christmas to me because I, I kind of got, and I think I did get, long before I was a computer journalist, what it could do. It's like, it's the network, it's yeah. going to, you know, that Kevin Kelly article, the famous Kevin Kelly article in Wired magazine, 1996. Yeah. I remember reading it. I mean, it's, it's the article now. It's, what does he say? The key innovations in the last 10 years have not been in the structure of computers but in the links between them and that's the takeoff point for me for the third fourth whatever you want to call it industrial revolution the network but then to see and I've written about you know as a computer journalist and as a commentator the network in 2003 I'm writing about the network and its power yeah. suddenly social networking bam I mean to me it's the whole is the future of our profession it's the future of what we do and and it, I was determined to pile into it. Peter Barron, who was my p editor at the time, the BBC had just had this m meeting saying, let's not be too prescriptive about things to do with social networking. So Barron, because we'd been talking about setting up a blog, said, just set it up, and then we'll go to a meeting and say we've set one up. And the BBC... that's the best way of getting things done in the yeah, BBC. BBC yeah, BBC... Uh, yeah. Somebody famous, really famously said from the BBC IT department, but this is not in the BBC's universe, uh, which I thought described the situation quite well. <laughs> but they then, they did take over, and they've re repeatedly taken over, so much so that now, that blog there... I wrote direct into blogging software uh, at 7.30 p.m. when I'd just come off that riot. But now I don't have access to the software. That's, that it's gradually moving away from us into the corporate. So it's not really blogging. But I, well, let's, talk, let's look at it. And then, well, that's it, isn't that's, it? That's yeah. it. Um, yeah. you can, I mean, blogging, we did it around Glen Eagles. I've, I've relentlessly persevered with it ever since. In fallow periods, I write about football or culture Rita Hayworth. I, I just write about anything I, that takes my fancy. And then when, it, when it's a hard period of news, I just tend to use it to try and expand what I do. Of course, what it did, but what Twitter has absolutely exponentially done, yeah. is then, it, then you're in a conversation with the 
audience way before you ever do your uber bit of journalism, which is your piece. How, and that's what I, want, I wanted to ask you about that, that relationship with the audience as a result of social media, as a result of Twitter and, and, and blogging. How, how, much do you, how important is that to you? How does it inf influence and affect your journalism? Well, look, it affects my MSM-style journalism yeah. in the sense that it, it, help, it informs it. Um, so <laughs> that piece there is called the Dubstep Rebellion. But within a, about two hours of it going up, a bloke had sent me um, a, a, a detailed refutation of the fact that the music on the riot was dubstep. <laughs> and in fact, within a day, somebody had produced a, a list of, a playlist of 10 tracks that were played. Because what happened is the really young working class kids from the FE colleges got their blackberries out, plugged them into this sound system that this hapless hippie from a, an organic farm had brought, and started playing what I now know to be grime music. And these other guys are made a list of what it was, so they sent me the list. Right, we'll prove to you it's not dubstep, it's grime. Now, all right, I kind of knew why this was important, but then I find out why. Because grime's banned. Grime is banned in every club in London. What, because it's actually banned from all the champagne popping, you know, sort of black clubs, because it's too violent. So what do these kids do age 16? They take, Trafalgar, take Parliament Square, set fire to a bench, and they play the music that's banned. I should have known that, but I'll know that in future. So that's how it informs you. It's about yeah. detail. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but let me say this, it's, it's way more than about the MSM stuff. Yeah. Actually, you know, I interviewed, as I said, one of the activists, I was doing this interview for my book today, <coughs> she said to me, I don't consume MSM anymore. This is not some crazy radical anarchist, you know, yeah. somebody who goes to Paris Fashion Week. You know, she said, I, I don't buy these papers anymore. What my ideal is, is we all join the social media and we become our own news source. And she said something that I, rang very true to me. She said, I know the news before it's on the news because I just follow journalists on Twitter. I do that now. I get most of my, I wake up in the morning, go on Twitter, what's happening? What's Andy Carbin saying from NPR? What's what are you saying, Stephanie? What's Robert Peston saying? Um, you know, what are people saying on their blogs and on Twitter? Well, that's the news to me. Um, the change in Libya is one of my people I follow. You know, the, you, there's some very astute tweeters from Libya who, of course, you would never go on air and say, hey, guess what? Um, there's been an advance for five kilometers out of these mountains to these mountains because we can't prove it from two sources. But it's enough for me. I'm just a consumer. You know, it'll be 10 hours before one of my colleagues, you know, begans it over, you know, over to the BBC. Yeah. But, but that's giving, that, that for a lot of broadcasters, a lot of people who are used to conventional, oh, you know, old school broadcasting, yeah. that's a real challenge, it's a real threat, isn't it? Yeah, and I, and I don't know what, what the outcome's going to be, because yeah. of course, of course, like, so Nick Davis is sitting there, presumably sweating with beads of sweat coming out of his top of his head, worrying whether somebody else is going to get this story. And he finally breaks it after years of work in the classic MSM way, bang, brings down the Murdoch empire. Suddenly all the tweeters are tweeting about it. Um, they can't do that without real journalism. Yeah. Can they get by without uh, an, uh, yet another report on, on, on Wills and Kate in you know, Canada? Uh, you know, with, which you could script before it had happened. You could tell what the, what the actual shots were going to be. Can they get, a lot of them think they can. So the challenge for us is not just to make sure that our, as it were, MSM product, and my ultimate product is Newsnight, but then this stuff is like my second tier product. Not just to make sure that that is infused with an understanding of the time, because otherwise it's like trying to be in the 60s without having heard, you know, without having heard the Beatles or the Rolling Stones. It's like it's like having to trying to uh, be a '60s politician without having without knowing about Profumo. It, you can't do it. But it might be just yeah. the the platform is burning. There might be a burning platform. Yeah. So it might be that it's worse than that. That a lot of our function becomes subsumed within a much bigger conversational media. And as we always used to yeah. say in the dot com boom, yeah. there's one thing for sure: if you're not in it you can't be doing it. Yeah. You, you, yeah. Even if you're going to lose, even if you're going to become the sort of, well, ultimately, Reed Elsevier, a good example, then bombed, crashed and burned. But at least they tried yeah. to be in it. 
Let's just have a look at your last, your last thing. This is, this is what you've described as a Twitter splurge. No, I, I should just walk, put... Somebody else described this to a, as a Twitter splurge. And, and then I Googled the word Twitter splurge. And I, I just warned, don't Google it. Because I think, <laughs> I think it's rude. Um, but so somebody else described what I do here. So what I'm doing is, is I'm, in, I'm in Arizona on the road. And the Brussels thing is happening. And the, the Guardian gets the leak of the... Um, of the uh, draft of the uh, of the eurozone deal on on Greek debt, and so I've got to blog about it. But you can't blog. You couldn't even blog this fast, even if you had access to word uh, to the, to the movable type, which we don't have anymore. Um, so I just thought, well, just do ten quick points on Twitter, and that's what I did. And um, it's um it's a little article, really. Um, uh, what's great at that point, you get other, other journalists, financial journalists, people who are there in Brussels, they'll tweet back, yeah, you're right on this, but wrong on that. All I'm really doing, am I doing that for the masses? I don't know. I don't care because actually I've got, what have we got now, 18,000 followers. Fine, if they want to read it, they read it. If they look at it and go, what is this? I missed point on, yeah. one to three, they'll move on. Yeah. But it, why not do it? I mean, it's a format other, I've seen other people do. And it's, um, I think it's a format that will grow as, the, as Twitter, you know, uh, becomes more populated by journalists. I mean, it's the best I could do. I'm just going to ask you one more question about Newsnight, and then we'll open it out to the floor. I mean, Newsnight is is a program. It's evolving all the time. I mean, you know, it's 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 about broadcasting. It's about you know. I mean, it, I mean, I, I I know I would see it in some ways as quite a small C conservative program. What, how, do, how does that, you know, how, you know, where do you see your role in Newsnight and, and how Newsnight kind of works as an operation? Well, Newsnight is a work in progress. Um, but obviously, Jeremy, you know, is a, to us who work in it, it's a big team thing and everybody who works in it really enjoys it. But to the public, all they ever want to know is, what's Jeremy Paxman like? That is the <laughs> brand, uh, even now, you know, and that's hard for that as that is for me. You know, it's probably even harder for the other presenters. But as a... As a programme, I think you're right to say it's, it's been small C conservative in the sense that its format is quite well set. Yeah. It's an A B audience. If we sold ads, that it'd be for Volvos and, and Mercs and, and probably Stannis Derlifts. Uh, <laughs> but big, long, curving ones to go up your mansion. Uh, <laughs> and um, OK, so I, I think Newsnight's a cast of characters, actually. And if you look at who we've got, and I mean, you know, one of my, two of my ex-colleagues here, you know, David and Stephanie, have, bo have both been part of that being the cast of characters uh, on it. It doesn't really care who the characters are as long as they're characters. You can replace me with somebody who's not interested in putting uh, that funny white stuff on and going into uh, gas mask type situations, and it'd be equally, um, it would be equally good, but it would just be different. And the beauty of it as a format, it survived, what is that, 30 years? I can't remember, it's 29, whatever. It's, it, it, it can fit that kind of bill. When I, when I was a, a viewer, I was always annoyed by it because I thought it was too laid back. But it's laid backness for the time of night is actually quite, quite good. The politicians have come back having decided to boycott it for a long time, they then, they, they've decided to try and come back on their own terms. And we'll see where they get with that. Um, you know, Lagarde came on and invited Osborne on. That was the interesting thing. Lagarde said, I've got a dinner guest. Would, could I bring him? And, and, and we said, yeah, well, what's his name? He said, George Osborne. <laughs> George, George is in the studio. I said, George, you haven't been on this program for some time. And he said, yes, because I didn't like to be harangued by Jeremy Paxman. I said, very interesting you come on with Christian Lagarde then, isn't it? So they're coming on. They're coming on. Um, it's been through the most incredible journey, actually, as a program. All was struggling because um, of resources. Uh, what's, that, what's my theory about what's happening yeah. under the digital age? OK, yeah, digital I mean. pulls yeah. every format up a peg in the temporal, in the speed. Uh, let me explain. News has to become 24-hour news. 24-hour news gets beaten by the internet and Twitter. Bulletins have to become more like news now. The editors of the, the 10 have, for several generations of editor of the 10, stolen news nights uh, old modus operandi. That yeah. you, you, Steph will go on and you'll do, you'll do primarily an analysis. I think you do a lot of analysis. All right, you've got your reporters out there, the, the guys on the front line of, of Libya, whatever. But you're also doing instant analysis. So what can we do? What we have to do is instant 60 minutes, instant panorama. 
and poor old Panorama in 60 minutes have to just be better uh, and, and quicker turnaround time. I mean, I didn't have never, worked, never worked on Panorama, but I understand that the, the turnaround times used to be quite vast, and now they're quite short for the same kind of stories. So we've all been pulled up, and Newsnight's there. So we live in this kind of twilight world between trying to do what we used to do, which is like, today's news has been this, and hear what it means. Uh, really, with trying to do slightly more off, not even off diary, but just like off the wall, uh, takes on reality. Peter Barron, our old editor, used to say something I think most of us still go by. That is, if you get to the end of, I think he used to say it was when, silver scooters. When was it? OK, there was a year in, in history when young people, adults, started to ride silver scooters. Somebody will know what year that was, but I don't. Peter Barron used to say, if you look back at the archive of Newsnight on that year, and there's no silver scooters on it, even once on the programme, you've failed. So what you've got to do is realise what's happening and just do it. It doesn't matter when it is. And I think, you know, we've built on that. The current editor, you know, Peter, Peter Rippon, you know, has built on that and has now got an idea of the programme far more as a sort of area for discussion. Uh, but, you know, the best laid plans, you know, we're, we're relentlessly developing the format. We're all bought into it. We're very keen. And, and we're, you know, we're fighting various kind of brick bats in the press. And then suddenly this thing comes along with Murdoch. And our, our viewing figures just like, yeah, they're true. through the roof. Yeah. Uh, why? Because suddenly people go, brilliant as the 10 is, uh, analysing and reporting, you can't get the key people sort of in real time. Russ Bridger, what's he going to say? What's yeah. that? I've forgotten the name of that guy in a white suit. The, uh, the News of the World reporter. What's he going to say this time? <laughs> uh, what's Paxman going to say? I mean, the EDL thing has been controversial, uh, but still, that is news night. I mean, it's edgy. You don't know what's going to happen. Who knows? Uh, so it's a great job to have. Uh, it's, it is a great job to have, except you don't get home until midnight. OK, we've got some time for some questions. Who's going to start? Any questions from, from anybody? I'll wait for the mic, please. Yes, I'm very keen to know how you switch from a musician <laughs> to an expert, or apparently an expert. I'm not an expert on <laughs> economics. I'm not an expert on economics. Okay, so how well, do you I'm only, feel confident I, to talk? Well, I would only. I'm only a reporter. Obviously, I. I well, Look, I, I, when I was at university, I did study political economy with a guy called Andrew Gamble, who's now, what is he? He's, I think he's something like professor of politics at Oxford or Cambridge. I can't remember. But Andrew, Andrew Gamble was a great guy, and he taught me a lot. And we, just, we, we read Adam Smith, and we read Ricardo, and we read Marx, we read Alfred Marshall. So we did all of that, as you do on a politics degree. I don't know why we're doing that. But um, we, uh, I'm not an economist, but all I am is a reporter. So, so obviously, I also talk about, I, my brother-in-law is a Latin teacher, and he revealed to me that he has uh, under his desk a Latin book, or oh, he has been a Latin teacher, you remember Jane, um, Brian, and he's we're in a private school, and he said, what you do is you get the Latin book under your desk, and you read it like this, and then you tell them, and then it looks like you know what you're doing. <laughs> and I, 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 with economics, One step I, ahead. yeah, I mean, I have to look a lot of it up. I mean, I don't have a degree in economics. A lot of it is there, and, and I think you just got to realize that you're on limits as well, because because there are parts of, of the genre and the, that I don't feel that confident about, and that's pro a weakness. Um, I don't stay away from them, but I probably report them in far more of a pedestrian way. So I'd say, um, but if you take a reporting approach to it, you can actually get quite a long way. Just keep that, well, what does that mean? I don't understand that. To be able to explain it to the viewer, you've got to then ask yourself, do you really understand it? And all the time when you're ticking away and the deadline's going and you're thinking, do I, there's something not right about this piece. And hopefully, sometimes this doesn't happen, hopefully a little bird on your shoulder says, that is because, do you don't understand it. And so you better go to one of your books, the ABC of, you know, what is economics or whatever, written by some FT journal, and find out. Uh, that, honestly, that is it. Um, the book I've written about, about the crisis is, is a journalistic account of it. And a lot of, the, although it's a book, a lot of it was, you know, I can't, I, there's a sort of slight critique of Alan Greenspan, and I kind of had that critique beforehand, but I immensely enjoyed going back and reading 
Greenspan and Bernanke's accounts of, um, and Milton Friedman's accounts of the crisis in a way that I'd never really approached them before once we'd had a new crisis. You're just learning all the time. Now, one day I'll probably come a cropper on air and then, then you'll all understand why. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question here. Hi. Hang on. Thanks very much. Um, you spoke at the beginning about uh, George Orwell and how he would sometimes pick up on um, situations which took place in two different time frames but would merge them together mm. to get a more realistic feel. I just wondered, bear in mind the Johan Hari controversy yeah. of late, how, where do you stand on kind of that, that search for the, the true kind of story oh, and how, how much you can kind of use interviews from different contexts? Right, I, I mean, it's a really tricky subject, and you, I'm glad you asked that. What do you do, by the way? Um, I'm about to start a course at City University. Good luck. It's a good course. <laughs> it's a good course. Uh, right, okay. The key is to understand the genre of reportage. Uh, all, the pe all this I call reportage. Uh, if you go downstairs, there's a nice little... Um, not very nice, actually, but a nice little tribute to all the people who died doing it, okay? But reportage, to me, is, is, a, is a, a concept. I can't remember the name. Somebody probably knows the, the famous Czech leftist who invented the idea. But what it is, it's, non, it's, non, it's a literary non-fiction. That's what I call it. It is a literary form of non-fiction. Why did Don McCullen frame that like that when he was probably crapping himself, uh, when bombs going around him, that guy there as well, you know, you can look at any of these pictures. Why did, the, why did they do that? Why did the person editing this photograph crop it like that? Because what they're trying to do is to do more than say, I saw this. It's I saw this and here's my textual or subtextual take on what I saw. Now, every culture in, from the 20s onwards began to move, began to develop not just reporting. So if you read you know, the account of the uh, Charge of the Light Brigade, I'd say that's reporting. But if you read um, some of the social documentary of the 30s, you get the rise of reportage where you're actually allowed to structure, you're allowed to create almost fictional characters. Now, there's the problem. Orwell did do that, and the example I've given is one, but people have used other examples, actually. But what, from this essay that I chose to start with, it's called Looking Back on the Spanish War. You may know that, that, uh, that Homage to Catalonia starts with a description of an Italian soldier who he thinks embodies to him the innocence and doomedness of the people he was with in the Spanish Civil War. Obviously, the other thing, he's not just embedded, he's got a rifle. It's the other, yeah, like, yeah. Before we go yeah, down yeah, yeah. any of these other moral issues, the guy's a combatant. Yeah. Um, so, is it permissible to structure one's narrative and to structure characters and events in a way that aids the overall picture? I would say it was, but we're now confronting, we're in a world of literalism. And, and there is, I think, I would always know err on the side of, of literalism because, see, why was Orwell doing this construction? Why were the people who did uh, the early reportage doing it? Because they wanted to try and communicate in a way that um, communicated with the mass. They suddenly had a mass audience. They suddenly realized journalism, thanks to Northcliffe, th thanks to um, Hearst, had a mass audience. And if you weren't going to just do shock, horror, five men trapped down mine, you would then have to do what is it Kirk Douglas in that famous film does? You don't have to do all the sneaky stuff to get the story. You've got to construct it into something that grabs the person. Um, you know, Jay Hunt used to famously say, the six o'clock news has got to make a mother feeding her baby in front of the six o'clock news go, oh, look, something's on the news. <laughs> that, you can't just do that without um, some art. But I'd say the art is probably... I think it's, it, I, I, I don't know what other people think. Uh, there's, there's you've got to do less art now because of all this other stuff, the, the, the reliance on... There's a bit of criticism there this lit, there's, of, of where we are now. You're, you sound dissatisfied by this, well, this literalism. Well, if we hadn't had all the kind of... If we hadn't had all the, the scandal around conflation, uh, that there has been... It's not just that you know, Johan Harry is one story, but yeah. there's lots of other examples. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, the BBC got into trouble for it, didn't it, from non-sequential use of yeah. stuff. I mean, if we hadn't had all, all of that, then we would still be in the kind of beautiful sort of heroic early classical period of journalism where you still can do what Orwell did. It's not just Orwell. As I say, it's all of this. Actually, you know, if you turn up at... Uh, maybe you went to the city and you do photojournalism. You turn up with that, somebody's going to go, right, I want to look at all, your, all the things around it because I want to know whether you sat in there, posed. Did you tell him to look at... Because like, they're going to worry, yeah? But that was the, the, the naive age. See, that, that, that shot there is far more... You could say that's quite well composed, that shot. It's got the golden section. You see the woman's hands on the left-hand side. Right bang, slap bang in the middle where the golden section tells you to put the centre. It's not the face. The face is one, but it's the hands as well. Beautifully composed, but you know that. You just know that is, don't you? Um, you know that one at the back I'm not so sure about. How many times that woman do that? Um, you know, iconic image. But we're all really, really suspicious of some of the great journalism, though. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying it, it's certainly in all my colleagues' minds about how, how unliterary you've probably got to be now. One more question? No. Uh, hang on, hang on. OK. okay. As, as a member of the public, I find it very difficult now to distinguish between propaganda different truths, depth of investigation, entertainment within a very uh, limited time. So how would you advise me to get my news? And that is... <laughs> it's, um, where do I get my news? The only answer I could give you is where do I get my news? I do um, use a mixture of media. Um, I think the British, you, until you go abroad, you will not understand how good the British television is. I think every single one of our competitors, as well as us, are really world class at, at actually providing the news. I mean, and what it is, it's not saying we get perfect every time. It's, look, lots of us are sitting around saying, did we get Norway right? Did we, you know, did we get, not, no, no news bulletin said Al Qaeda, whatever. I don't think anybody said yeah. that. A lot of people probably thought it was, and, and, and their professional yeah. ethos pr restrained them from saying it yeah. uh, in the way the, the Sun did it. I'm talking about news bulletins here. <laughs> uh, no, no, new TV news TV, bulletins. Yeah. So, yeah. so the Sun got it wrong. OK, but one, because we work in a world of checks and balances. Two, because we're actually interested in whether we've got it wrong. Um, we're not interested, you know, all of them, they're all driven by ratings, but they're none of them driven by ratings so badly that they'll do the kind of stuff that you'll see in American TV do. Um, and like, you know, even some really respected colleagues ended up putting themselves at the centre of that Greek riot in a way that, you know, you were really aware of how risible that had made them look at, to, to some of their audience. So, all I say is the telly is not a bad place to start. And the broadsheet newspapers, I think, you know, the Times, Telegraph, the Guardian, I think, I, I think they are, that's it really for me. The Indies just starved the resources and it's a bit, you know, it's a bit, it doesn't know what it wants to be. And then there's lots of specialist news. There's lots of, between the bloggers and the tweeters, there's lots of sort of semi, it's, not, it's real journalism, but it's also, it's not where you would normally go. You wouldn't have bought uh, Computer Weekly or Construction News. Uh, in the past, but you know, even things like TMZ, you know, I mean, they got the story. Yeah. Michael Jackson's dead. That's yeah. you know, if you were kind of Northcliffe in the 1930s, you got bloody good. Well done. That's journalism. Oh, okay, it's a bit weird, but so all I'm trying to say to you is, I think everybody has to have a tactical manoeuvre uh, towards news, and you've got to constantly change because you've got to constantly understand who's doing what on what news. Just. Make your own palette of it up and consume what you want, really. That's the best advice I can give you. We've got time for one more, I'm afraid. Last Rabbit question. On it. Given the lack of an alternative in the Middle East, what role do you see social media playing in propelling change in that part of the world? Well, I have to say, I don't think there is a lack of an alternative because I'm a big fan of Al Jazeera. Um, and all where it be, I don't speak Arabic, so I've never really seen Al Jazeera Arabic apart from the pictures. I think Al Jazeera English is a really 
high class operation. I don't agree with the way they do everything. Uh, I also think, you know, I, I've been doing some research on this, that the weird thing is that in the past three years, Egyptian television, you know, our AJ's share, we're talking about the Arabic Middle East here, Arabic speaking Middle East, leaving, leaving Israel aside, because obviously there is a kind of Western style media in Israel that has got, you know, its own challenges. Uh, and, and, and I've never reported from there, so I, I haven't even experienced it. But the Middle East, yeah, fair enough. Uh, Egyptian TV, by mimicking AJ, had built a share from almost 9% to something like 38% of, compared to AJ's first and second choice viewing of 78% of all viewers in the region. Uh, but the problem was it couldn't then tell us anything about the events that happened. So, it's, so it, it hasn't collapsed, but it mini collapsed, and then it's working its way back under the new regime. So I think TV has played a massive amplifying role, but also some of the papers. What you probably don't realize until you get there is that not only nobody reads the paper, you know, the papers, the, the, the papers are not that good in Egypt. They're all kind of semi controlled by sort of good old boy type politicians. Uh, but one thing that always sticks in my mind is Al Masri Al Ayyum, somebody will know how to say this better than me, uh, which is an Egyptian newspaper, put the key bit of social media footage on, which is where they take the bridge. It, just Type in, take the bridge, Al Masri Al Yum, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's an unedited footage of the crowd being driven off the bridge and coming back and rolling this kiosk. They found an iron kiosk, which is higher than them. They roll it. And um, the more you find out later, it was the uh, football fans of um, uh, Al Ahli and, um, and um, Z what's the other team? Z Z Zamalek, who'd done that. And um, the, I think the media, the, the social media, uh, has been a brilliant thing in, e in Egypt, and obviously Tunisia as well. And the other thing I'll point out is this, this. Don't stop at the social media. Don't go, Egyptian telly's here, you know, Al Arabiya and Al AJ are there, and then there's Twitter and Facebook. Rap, yeah. rap music, rap yeah. music, graffiti. This is all communication. And if you look at what happened in hip hop and rap music in North Africa, and if you look at graffiti, and if you look at the snatches of songs and poems people were singing <coughs> to each other, it's all part of the same thing. Uh, we're, we are incredibly challenged, aren't we? Because we're trying to study one of the great events, as great as 1989. And then we've got some of the people here who were there you know, in the, in the 1989, and, and, and earlier, David, I should say. Uh, but, but, but you know, the challenge of, 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 of reporting that was, was big. But the challenge of reporting this is you know, even bigger because nobody knows where it's going. So uh, I, I, I think we'll start to see little, little coalescences of bloggers and tweeters and journalists. Guardians recruited about 80, what was it, 38 Arabic bloggers in the North African region to write for Comment is Free. I'm getting, I'm getting evil You're looks. Getting from, evil I'm, looks from getting evil I'm gonna, I'm, what I'm going to allow is a short question over there, a short question there, and a short answer from you. Right, okay, I can't give okay. short answers. <laughs> well, it's all relative, isn't it? It's all relative. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. My name is Junaid, uh, freelance producer. How do you pick and choose the stories which you would report? All right, all right short answer on that is I have my list of what I want to report. Um, my bosses have the list of what is what they want me to report. The news agenda obliterates all of that constantly, and, and you just have to report something you don't want to report because it's ha just happened. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's a negotiation. I have to say on Newsnight, uh, it's because it is an analysis program. You 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 have at least have a choice. Uh, th that 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 that's how it. I, I never report on anything that I don't want to do, uh, really. I mean, but it's it's a rare thing where you don't want to do it. I mean, I ended up covering the murder of that uh, kid in Liverpool who got shot, Reese Jones, just because I happened to be on duty at the time when it was happened. And then we said, "Shall you go tomorrow at six a.m. and do it?" And it, you know. I was business correspondent at the time, but what I thought was, there's got to be something going on here that we don't know about. And of course, there was. You just get there and start asking. So, just do that. That's short sure enough. Last question. Last question. Uh, see, as an accomplished broadcaster and with inside information, um, I'd actually like to know whether Robert Peston has been on a training course, or are we just getting used to him? <laughs> <laughs> Look, Robert. Robert. 
<laughs> Robert Preston, yeah, I think, is one of the giants of his generation. And I say that without any irony or any, yeah. any you know, he's, yeah. one of, he's, my, he's one of the people like, we're not rivals, but we go after the same stories. We're all kind of trying to do it better than each other. That's because we're not driven by even ratings, actually, but certainly not by profit. We're all up against each other and everybody else. Yeah. I just say, I think Robert's achievement in the last, you know, since, since the Northern Rock thing, which has been unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, but look, what, the way he reports shows you that he's a real person. You know, do, that, that's the point, isn't it? Yeah. I'm a real person. We're all real. At least you don't have what you have in America, which a lot of very unreal people. Uh, be, think yourselves, and I just spent a week in America. Think yourselves lucky. <laughs> Fantastic. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time this evening. I hope you enjoyed yourself. And Paul, I know it's going to be around for a bit, so you can grab him up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.